Test. Meaning will begin shortly.
ahead and hit it and say, I call this meeting to order. Go ahead and hit it. Yeah. Go ahead. I call this meeting to order. Well, thank you, Honorary Mayor for the day, Giselle Willis, who I'll introduce in a little while. Uh, thank you for calling this meeting to order. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, we have with us tonight for the invocation and pledge, Dr. Jeff Pennington from Smyrna First Baptist Church. Is Dr. Pennington here? No. Uh, Mr. Welsh, would you please uh, lead the invocation and pledge? Everybody, please rise. Pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening, Lord, and we just thank you for the blessing that we have to live in this great country that we have, to have the freedoms that we have, and just to be a part of these United States and, and this city, Lord. And we just ask that you bless upon us this evening. Ask that you show us the things that we should do for the citizens and be with each and every decision here, be with each and every person here, Lord. We just ask you to watch over us, protect us, and keep us on our travels for home this evening. In your name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We don't have any agenda changes this evening. Um, and on my mayoral report, I'm gonna take the opportunity to introduce our honorary mayor for the day, Giselle Willis. Giselle has had a really good day today. She came here and toured City Hall, and um, we sat in my office for a little while and answered questions that she had about government and what I do and what the council does. Came down here and kind of did a run through for tonight, and then we had a good lunch. She asked a lot of great questions, but Giselle is a student going into the fourth grade at St. Benedict's. Um, she plays soccer, is actually on my daughter Sam's team, and is missing practice right now for this, so we, we won't tell them though, okay? Gymnastics, piano, and singing, and just a very talented young lady, and we're so pleased to have her here uh, with us this evening. And I have a honorary mayor for the day um, certificate here. And it says, the city of Smyrna, Georgia, be it known that Giselle Willis has been bestowed with the esteemed title of Honorary Mayor of the Day. In recognition of her exceptional spirit, enthusiasm, and curiosity, Giselle Willis is hereby granted the full authority and admiration that accompanies the prestigious role of Honorary Mayor of Smyrna for this special day, given this 12th day of August, 2024, Derek Norton, Mayor, City of Smyrna. So why don't we go down and get a picture? Her parents are here, uh, Mac and April, and um, we'll go down here and get a picture, okay? I love doing the honorary mayor for the day and getting, getting kids involved and, and interested in what we're doing with, with local government. Um, next is uh, proclamations and presentations. We don't have any, so we'll move on to community development items. We have one item tonight that's gonna be tabled. Um, this is 
Item A, zoning amendment to allow modifications to the currently approved site plan, land lot 380, 4.95 acres at 3240 South Cobb Drive, LBX Four Corners, LLC. And this uh, is being tabled at the request of the applicant until the September 23rd, 2024 mayor and council meeting. I need a motion, please. I have a motion by Councilman Lindley, do I have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Wilkinson. All council's memberships, please vote. Ms. Hines, how do you vote? I vote in the affirmative. Okay. Ms. Hines is joining us remotely this, this evening. And that passes 7-0. Thank you. We'll move on to formal business now. Uh, item A is to approve resolution 24-010 authorizing the city to enter into an intergovernmental economic development agreement and other documents incident to the downtown Smyrna Development Authority's issuance of bonds at an amount not to exceed $16,700,000 with the proceeds to be used to finance the cost of acquiring and renovating economic development projects and authorize the mayor or mayor pro tem to sign and execute all related documents. Mr. Bennett, the background, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The Downtown Development Authority is being asked to issue bonds for the purchase and improvement of the First Baptist Church property as part of an expansion of the downtown district. The bonds will be issued in accordance with the provisions of the Master Bond Resolution. The Intergovernmental Economic Development Agreement requires intergovernmental contract payments from the city to the authority in amount sufficient to cover all debt service on the bonds. The City Council has formed a study committee to coordinate public input and alongside the city's community development and economic development staff to advise on next steps for the long-term use and development of the property being purchased. The recommend recommendation is for the approval of resolution RES 2024-010. And this is just another step in the um Great opportunity before us in the city of Smyrna uh, with the Baptist Church property and uh, the opportunity that the church has to, to exist near our downtown uh, on Atlanta Road. Is there any discussion on this item? This is in Ward 3. Yes, sir. I have a second. Second. Second by Mr. Oglesby, and this is where you say... All council memberships, please vote. And Ms. Hines, how do you vote? I vote in the affirmative, thank you. Okay. And that passes 7-0, thank you. Item B, authorization for the approval to purchase the previously leased Toro Real Master Mower 3100D 2018 model from Jerry Pate Turf and Irrigation to use in the park system at a total cost of $19,500 to be paid monthly over the term of 36 months from the park's maintenance line item to discontinue the current month-to-month -month lease and authorize the mayor to sign and execute all related documents. This seems pretty straightforward. Mr. Bennett, is there any background? No, sir. The, um, we're currently leasing the unit um, to purchase a new unit would be approximately $55,000 to $62,000 with a one-year lead time to receive it. And we've been offered the uh, opportunity to purchase the, this mower out of lease for $19,500. Okay. Any discussion? Okay. This is where you say. I need a motion, please. So moved by Mr. Pickens. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Welch. There you go. All council members, please vote. Ms. Hines, how do you vote? In the affirmative, thank you. Okay. And that passes 7-0, thank you. Next, we have a change order, item C, approval of the change order request from Baldwin Paving at 1014 Ken Mill Drive, Northwest Marietta, Georgia 30060, in the amount of $9,287.33 for tinted concrete for simulated brick pavers on the Windy Hill project versus applying color topically and authorize the mayor to sign and execute all related documents. I, I believe all change orders in, in any amount uh, at Windy Hill are coming to us for a vote. And is there any other background, Mr. Bennett? 
Yes, we're doing a regular inspection of work performed at the Windy Hill Road project site. City staff identified that the color tint used to simulate brick pavers and the textured concrete was being applied to the surface after placement of the concrete rather than being tinted by a batch in the mixer. It is the city's practice to place both batch tinted concrete for aesthetics of the concrete over time, but this constraint was not indicated in the bid documents. This change order is the difference in cost to meet city standards. Any discussion? Okay. I need a motion, please. A move to approve item 9C, um, CHOR 2024-010. Second by Mr. Lindley. All council members, please vote. And Ms. Hines, how do you vote? In the affirmative. Okay. And that passes 7-0. Item D, authorization and award of RFQ 25-001 to CSTE Incorporated, 1337 Canton Road, Suite K, Marietta, Georgia 30066, in the amount of $321,000 to be paid from the 2022 SPLOST parking deck line item for the construction of 44 parking spaces at 2688 Atlanta Road and authorize the mayor to sign and execute all documents. Mr. Bennett, the background, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The City of Smyrna requested bids to construct a 44-space surface parking lot at 2688 Atlanta Road. The scope of work includes the demolition of the existing parking area and building foundation, grading, sanitary sewer, potable water, curb and gutter, asphalt paving, parking lot lighting, storm sewer piping, and detention. The three bids were received on July 12th, 2024, and the lowest responsive and responsible bidder is CSTE Incorporated in the amount of $321,000. Bid results are CSTE, $321,000, Summit Construction and Development, LLC, $434,136.97, and International Waste Services for $471,927.64. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. This, this was a pivot by this council um, that we talked about at our retreat and the parking deck had soared in cost since it was originally approved to over $40,000 a space. And we didn't think that was a very good use of taxpayer funds. Um, we decided to do the surface lot instead and then um, maybe look at other opportunities for parking structures in the future as our downtown expands. So any discussion on this or comments from council? I need a motion, please. Motion due pass is presented. I have a motion due pass, do I have a second? Second by Mr. Welch. Out all, all council members, please vote. And Ms. Hines, how do you vote? We'll vote in the affirmative, thank you. Okay. Like we're waiting on Ms. Wilkinson. Have a little bit of technical difficulty. Okay, we have all votes. And that's approved 7 0. Thank you. Uh, last item on formal business is item E, approval of amended comp framework agreement, CFA between Cobb County, Georgia and the city of Smyrna, Georgia for the 2022 Cobb SPLOST renewal joint city projects and authorize the mayor to sign and execute all related documents. Mr. Ben Mr. Benedict, the background, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. At the May 20th, 2024 regular meeting of the mayor and council, was approved the Cobb Framework Agreement to jointly complete three identified projects. In implementing this agreement, the Cobb County DOT Director and the Smyrna Public Works Director identified differences in the allocated budgets. The Windy Hill project cost remains at $1 million, but the sports field lighting is reduced to $750,000. Regarding the East-West Connector projects as Cobb DOT would perform the work, it will simplify the tracking and accounting if the city does not receive the funds, but they are allocated on the city's behalf. Additionally, the terms of the disbursement of the balance of funds is a letting of bid documents for construction, which does not apply to either the East-West Connector projects or to the Windy Hill Road project. The new schedule will disperse the entire $1,750,000 in a single payment 
and there will be no monthly disbursements. This amended CFA corrects the budget amounts and disbursement schedule while leaving all other terms unchanged. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Any discussion or comments from council? Okay, here you go. I need a motion, please. So moved by Mr. Lindley. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Ogilvie? Yes. Okay. All council members, please vote. Ms. Hines, how do you vote? I vote in the affirmative. And that passes 7-0. We'll now move to the consent agenda. Here, this is what you read over here, Mr. Mr. Benedict, can you please read the consent? Consent. The consent, the agenda for council approval. Yes, ma'am. Item A, MIN 2024-111, approval of the July 25th, 2024 Committee of the Whole Minutes. Item B, MIN 2024-113, approval of the July 29th, 2024 Pre-Council Minutes. Item C, MIN 2024-115, approval of the July 29th, 2024 Mayor and Council Minutes. Item D, ATH 2024-109, Approve road closures for Hispanic Heritage event to be held on September 21st, 2024, from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. from King Street, from Bank Street to Powder Spring Street. And item E, APP 2024-001, appointment of Human Resources Manager Gwen Spruill as the City Civil Service Board Clerk. And finally, item F, ATH 2024-113, Approval of revisions to the City of Smyrna public art policy and authorize the mayor to sign and execute all related documents. Thank you, Mr. Bennett. Um, can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, please? So moved by Mr. Gould. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Lindley. All council members, please vote. Ms. Hines, your vote? Let me affirm it. Thank you. And that passes 7-0. Um, we now have our time for public comment, and we have one person signed up to speak this evening, Pamela Barton, if you're here and like to come up and state your name and address for the record. Welcome. Hi. Thank you. My name is Pamela Barton. I live at 1700 Hissop Boulevard in Smyrna. Can you speak into the microphone? I'm sorry. Thank My you. name is Pamela Barton. I live at 1700 Hissop Boulevard in Smyrna. Um, the last couple of weeks, I've been emailing probably all of you, specifically my ward number seven, Mr. Oglesby, about the issues in my neighborhood. I live in Riverview, off Riverview Road, in Riverview Terrace home, Homes, built by Meritage Homes. Since I've been there roughly a year, August 23rd will make a year, I can tell, can't tell you how many floods we've had inside the homes. Um, they're trying to come up with a fix. Our warranties are running out. They're not fixing anything. They're not responding at this point. And I went out of the country uh, last week, got back on Tuesday. Again, another young couple displaced because their house is flooding. I don't know what to say or what's happening. Um, they tell us that they don't have the right pipes from the street to the, from the house to the street. I don't know if that's right or not. There's no oversight. The homeowners association people have gone mad. They've spent $16,000 on pine straw. We can't get any backup. It's just a mess. I, we need help. I don't know what to do, what to say anymore. I don't sleep at night. I wake up in the middle of the night running downstairs to make sure there's no water. I'm too old for this. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sorry that you're dealing with that. Mr. Bennett, can you get her information and make sure that we uh, meet about this and see if there's anything that we can do from our? Yes, sir. Rusty and I'll address. Yeah, Rusty, okay. Can you, can y'all, yeah, if you'll get okay. with Rusty. Thank, thank you. for you. Thank you for letting us. And we would never you. know unless I you tell us, it. right? Okay. Thank you. We have nobody else signed up for public comment this evening, um, so we'll, We'll close that. We'll move on to ward and staff reports and start tonight with Mr. Glenn Pickens. Uh, thank you, Mayor. No report this evening. 
Ms. Hines, did you have a report? No, sir, just that we have our CMA meeting tomorrow. That's it. Okay. Mr. Lindley. No report this evening. Mr. Welch. No report. Ms. Wilkinson. Thank you, Mayor. No report this evening. Mr. Gould. No, sir. No, no report. Mr. Oglesby. Hey, I don't have a report, but I do have a comment. Uh, this weekend, this Friday night, it's Friday Night Lights, Campbell High School's varsity football team takes the field against Chapel Hill at 7.30. Let's come out as a city and support our local football team and give them a good start. Uh, it's bitter, bittersweet for me. This will be the first year in many years that I'm not on the field Friday or Saturday, so officiating football, but come out and support our local team and our students and athletes. Thank you. Along those lines, I forgot to mention on uh, Wednesday, is that right? The 15th, whatever the 15th is. That's on Thursday. Um, there's a, a Spartan Shield, the first meeting of what's called the Spartan Shield. Since you mentioned Campbell football, you made me think of it. It's at 6 p.m. over at Campbell High School, and it's uh, uh, if you want to come and uh, be part of a group that supports the, the football team uh, financially and trying to get their facilities up to speed and something that the community can be proud of, uh, this is the initial meeting to get more information about how to do that. So um, I'll be there, and I hope to see anybody who has interest. Uh, Mr. Bennett, anything? Yes, sir, I do. Just a reminder that uh, Campbell High School's varsity softball team takes the field for their first game uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock at uh, Hillgrove uh, High School. So anybody that might be interested in coming to watch. Mr. Cochran, anything? No. Ms. Heather? No, okay. Uh, we're now at uh, the point of our meeting where we're going to go into an appeal hearing, and that's the time that I'm going to dismiss our um, esteemed honorable mayor honorary mayor for the day, Ms. Giselle. But let's give her a round of applause for helping us like she did today. Here, I'll walk you down. Come on. Good job. Thank you again, Giselle. That was awesome. All right, we're going to move on now to our um, appeal hearing. This is item 13, Atlantic Billboard, Webb, Kloss, and LeMond, uh, LLC. We have, uh, we're going to do items A through H together. Um, this is number 70 through 79, and uh, I'll go ahead and call up the representative for Atlanta Bill Atlantic Billboard now. Good evening, Mayor and uh, Council. Uh, my name is Franklin Lemond. I'm an attorney at Webb Clayson Lemond, and I'm here uh, with Mike Fitzgerald, uh, who is the managing member of Atlantic Billboards LLC, uh, the appellant uh, for these appeals. Uh, we certainly appreciate you taking the time to hear from us today. Uh, I must say, in, in my 20 years of, of doing these presentations to the Mayor and City Council, I've never been uh, privileged to see a mayor of the day presentation. I thought that was wonderful. I think that's a great idea uh, on how to get uh, uh, young people involved in, in city government. Uh, and so that was a real treat. Uh, I'm just glad that I was able to see that uh, today. And I'm sure that uh, that young lady and her family uh, had a wonderful experience that they'll remember for, 
for some time. Um, so uh, we're here to appeal, uh, and, and we filed two separate appeals, as the mayor uh, indicated. Um, and I'll speak to the first uh, group of appeals. Um, just a, a little bit of, of factual background. So uh, on March the 28th of, of this year, uh, Atlantic submitted 10 applications uh, for signs at various locations in the city, uh, and those were uh, submitted uh, via the online portal uh, system that the, the city has set up uh, to obtain, or to receive permits, rather, excuse me. Um, and I've got uh, a, a map that I could share with everybody, if that's okay, that just shows where these sign locations are around the city so that we know what we're talking about. I don't know if I brought enough for, for everybody up there, but uh, you certainly could, could share, but it's just for illustrative purposes only. And so the, the first group of applications that we're here to talk about uh, is all of the dots that are on the map with the exception of the Oakdale Road uh, slash NS for Norfolk Southern location uh, that it's at the bottom uh, portion of the map closest to Mableton. Um, so we're gonna put that one aside for a moment, but uh, the other applications that we're talking about are the other uh, dots on, on the map. Um, and so my client submitted these uh, 10 applications on uh, the 28th of March of this year, like I said. Now, as to two of these uh, 10 original locations that were submitted, it was subsequently determined uh, that they were for locations that were outside of the city limits. And so, of course, we took those two off the table and we said, obviously, you know, the city can't process or issue permits for properties that are outside the city limit, and so we withdrew those. And so there's, there's eight sign locations that are remaining that we're here to discuss today. Um, now, uh, if, if we look at uh, the city sign code, uh, which is found at uh, chapter 82 signs of the city's code of ordinances, and I've got a certified copy of that ordinance that I'd just like to put into the record and I'll hand it to the clerk. Um, I certainly don't expect you guys to, to look at it, but I just want to highlight one provision that we're going to be dealing with here tonight, and that's section 82-5, uh, subset F. Uh, and this provision of the, of the city code says that the city shall process all applications within 45 business days and shall give notice to the applicant of its decision by hand delivery or by mailing a notice to the address on the sign permit application on or before the 45th business day. And so this subsection of the code makes it clear that the city shall process an application within 45 business days and shall give notice to the applicant of the decision either by hand delivery uh, or by mail to the address on the sign permit application. Now, 45 business days from March the 28th of 2024 uh, was June 3rd of 2024. Um, however, the city did not provide notice to Atlantic of its decision either by hand delivery or by mailing a notice uh, to Atlantic or to Mr. Fitzgerald, uh, whose address was on the application, as required by section 82-5 subsection F. Uh, now, under Georgia law, uh, shall means that a government must do exactly what the ordinance requires. Uh, and it's clear, based on uh, the record in this case, that Smyrna did not follow these requirements. My client didn't get a hand delivery uh, of the city's decision, uh, and my client uh, did not receive anything by mail uh, at the address on the application within 45 business days. Uh, as required by 82-5, subsection F. Uh, now, in our appeal letter that we submit, submitted uh, after not getting a decision within the 45 days, uh, 
we provided uh, the city, and I believe it's part of the, the packet that's available uh, to you all tonight, uh, with four decisions from various courts uh, around the metro Atlanta area. Uh, and the four cases are Railroad Outdoor versus DeKalb County, uh, the Lamar Company versus City of College Park, Tinsley Media versus City of Woodstock, and SMD LLP versus City of Roswell. And in each of these cases, courts held that uh, permits had to be issued uh, based on the city or the county's failure to comply with the time limits uh, that are included in the ordinance. And so given the city's failure to properly uh, process these applications and provide uh, notice of a decision within the 45 business days, either by hand delivery uh, or by mailing a notice to the address on the signed permit application, uh, the city was in violation of its own uh, ordinances. And now, of course, under, uh, under Georgia law and under federal law, uh, you know, sign codes are required to have uh, deadlines. Uh, and without them, ordinances have been found to be unconstitutional under state uh, and federal law. Uh, and that's part of the basis for the four decisions that I cited to you uh, just recently, saying that you know, because the city or the county did not uh, comply with the time limits uh, and properly process the applications, then of course permits uh, were required to be issued by the courts. Um, and so because the city uh, did not properly uh, process these applications and provide a decision within 45 business days uh, as required by the code, uh, we respectfully submit that uh, the city's refusal uh, to approve these applications should be reversed uh, and that the mayor and city council should vote uh, to approve uh, these applications uh, because the city did not comply uh, with uh, the plain language of 82-5F and under Georgia law, therefore, uh, my clients are entitled to the permits. Um, but beyond uh, the, the issue that we have raised regarding the, the, the failure to process the applications in accordance with 82-5 subsection F, um, as to uh, the locations uh, at issue in this first batch of applications that are on railroad property, uh, we submit that the denial or the refusal to issue the permits uh, on these locations would also be improper because uh, railroads uh, have not been zoned uh, in the city of Smyrna. And I've got uh, certified copies of the map. I just have a few. Um, I'd like to put these into the record. That show uh, the zoning districts throughout the city uh, but you can plainly see if you review uh, the zoning map uh, that the railroad areas uh, have not been zoned. Uh, and so it's our position that because there's no zoning of rail properties, uh, then the railroad uh, and my client uh, who has a contract with the railroad to put signs on these parcels uh, is entitled to uh, the free use of that property because there's no uh, zoning for those parcels, therefore there's no restrictions. Uh, and Georgia law is very clear that uh, ordinances must be strictly construed in favor of the property owner and where there's any ambiguity regarding whether the use is allowed or not, uh, it must be allowed. And so it's our position that as to the, the rail properties, um, given the fact that they're not zoned, uh, that the use that's been requested in this instance uh, should be allowed. Um, and so uh, for that additional reason, we would request that uh, the refusal to approve uh, the applications should be reversed. Um, now I've got, uh, moving on to an additional reason uh, beyond those two why we feel that our appeal should be granted. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, some evidence here that's going to establish uh, from our perspective that Chapter 82 signs of the city's code was not properly adopted in the fashion required by Georgia's zoning procedure law. Um, now, 
the version of Georgia's zoning procedure law in effect in 2005 when the sign ordinance or the sign code was adopted. Um, if you look at OCGA 36-66-4A, it required that notice be published uh, in a newspaper of general circulation uh, at least 15 days, but not more than 45 days prior to the date of a hearing. Um, and the notice must include uh, the time, place, and the purpose of the hearing. Uh, and that's so that people uh, can appear at council meetings like we are here tonight, uh, have their uh, voices heard and their opinions heard on, on certain items. And so in order to uh, investigate uh, the, whether or not the city complied with Georgia's zoning procedures law, I submitted an open records request. Uh, Ms. Korn was very kind in working with me and getting the documents uh, provided in response to my request. And one of the items that she produced um, is a copy of the legal notice that was run uh, on July 22nd, 2005 regarding the adoption of the sign code. And I've got copies of the document that uh, Ms. Korn produced in response to my open records request. And if you look at that notice, once it gets passed around, uh, you'll see that the notice puts uh, the, the public on, on notice, and this was run on, on July 22nd of 2005, put the public on notice that uh, the sign code was going to be uh, considered uh, and, and possibly uh, adopted on August the 15th of 2005. Um, however, uh, in reviewing the documents that were subsequently provided to me uh, by Ms. Korn. Uh, at that August 15th of 2005 meeting, uh, the sign ordinance or the sign code uh, was not adopted, uh, was not passed. Um, it, it, that didn't happen, so nothing happened on the, the date uh, that was noticed. And it wasn't until months later uh, that the sign code was eventually adopted by uh, the mayor and city council. Um, and I've got the, uh, the agenda and the minutes and the ordinances. Uh, this was quite voluminous, so I only made two copies. I apologize, but I, even though I'm a sign company uh, advocate, I do try to conserve trees, so I didn't want to print off a big tome. So I've got two copies of the agenda um, for the October 17th, 2005 meeting when the sign code uh, was ultimately adopted by the city. Um, but what I didn't get in response to my open records request from the city was any advertisement for this meeting. So the public did not receive, as they were supposed to under OCGA 3666-4A, a, a notice that was published at least 40, excuse me, at least 15, but no more than 45 days prior to this uh, October 17th, 2005 meeting. Um, and of course, the, the July 22nd advertisement that I put into the record, uh, that can't satisfy the notice requirement for this eventual meeting in October because of course, it's beyond 45 days in time as required by the statute. And of course, that notice didn't say anything about a meeting taking place in October. It said that there was going to be a meeting in August. And so because there was no uh, public notice, uh, at least 15, but no more than 45 days prior to that October 17, 2005 uh, adoption meeting, uh, it's our contention that the adoption of the sign ordinance uh, was a nullity. Uh, and, and that's what case law on failure to comply with Georgia's zoning procedures law states, that if you don't comply with ZPL, then the ordinance is void under Georgia law. Uh, and therefore, since there was no valid ordinance in place, uh, the city, of course, can't rely on an invalid ordinance to deny my client's applications. 
Uh, and so the requested sign locations uh, should be granted because there's no restriction uh, in place that would prevent those signs from going up. Um, now, in addition to the uh, ZPL issue that I just talked about, uh, I'd also like to preserve uh, for the record an additional challenge, um, and it's our position that Chapter 82 signs of the city code is unconstitutional under Georgia law. Uh, and in the appeal uh, statement that we submitted on these first batch of applications, uh, we presented uh, a case, Coffee versus Fayette County, which is the case uh, that my firm worked on where we uh, went to the Georgia Supreme Court twice and the Georgia Court of Appeals once, uh, all in the same case, uh, and the Supreme Court held that uh, sign restrictions in Georgia uh, must comply with what's referred to as the least restrictive means test. Uh, and it's, of course, it's our position that uh, the city's code doesn't comply with the least restrictive means test. Uh, and then we also cite in our appeal letter uh, the portion of the, of the code uh, that we believe and assert creates a presumption that all signs not expressly allowed are prohibited. Um, and in a, a case uh, that my firm also worked on, Fulton County versus Galbraith, they went to the Georgia Supreme Court twice. Um, the Georgia Supreme Court held that an ordinance such as this that says that signs are presumptively uh, invalid or, or not allowed, except it's expressly allowed, is the antithesis of the First Amendment. Uh, because as to speech, the presumption should be that speech is allowed uh, and then can be curtailed in certain circumstances. But to start off with the reverse uh, premise uh, is invalid under Georgia law. Uh, and so, you know, I think Georgia law is pretty clear that for the purposes of, of this hearing today, all I need to do is to put the city on notice that we're preserving these arguments. I'm certainly not asking uh, you, you ladies and gentlemen as a body to, to declare your ordinance unconstitutional, but I do want to put that uh, on the record. Now, I will talk uh, in a, uh, subsequently about the second batch, or the, the second application that was put in. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit further when we get to that point, but I do want to, to put in some additional documents into the record that, that illustrate that the city does know uh, that it's supposed to send written notice as required under the code because, you know, my client, uh, after submitting the original batch, uh, reapplied, uh, hoping to move one of the locations that was outside of the city into the city. Uh, and in response to that initial attempt, uh, my client did receive a timely determination uh, that came in mail uh, to the address that was on the application. And so I'd like to make these uh, denial letters. It's for a location that is outside the city, and so it's not, uh, it's not at issue for the purposes of, of the appeal, but the fact that the city received the application processed it in a timely fashion, and sent a written denial as is required by 82-5 subsection F that I spoke about earlier, uh, illustrates that, that the city uh, knows that it's supposed to uh, handle applications in this fashion, uh, but it's clear that as to the first eight, uh, it did not do so. And then after receiving that letter that I just introduced saying that uh, that application location was outside uh, the city limits. My client submitted an, an additional application that will be the final appeal that we talk about, the Oakdale Road location. Uh, and once again, as to that location, the city timely uh, issued a written denial and sent it to Atlantic Billboards at the address uh, that was located on the application form. And so I'd like to uh, introduce uh, copies of that letter as well. establishing that, uh, you know, the city uh, is aware of the fact that under 82-5F uh, that it's supposed to process applications in this fashion 
and indeed as to the subsequent application submitted my, by my client, it did. And so I just introduced those to, uh, to further uh, illustrate the fact that as to the initial eight applications, uh, this required procedure was not followed by the city. Uh, and so based on uh, these four grounds uh, that I have articulated, um, I would uh, respectfully request that, uh, that my client's appeal uh, be granted. Um, but, uh, you know, d despite the, the, the content of my uh, presentation here tonight, which uh, admittedly, you know, has a lot of, of legalese and presentation of, of legal positions uh, that have to be on the record under Georgia law, uh, I, you know, I want to make it clear that my client, uh, you know, isn't, doesn't want to fight with Smyrna, doesn't want to, you know, in, be involved in litigation with Smyrna. Uh, rather, it wants to do business with the city. Um, you know, it's, it's got uh, leases and or agreements with uh, landowners within the city that stand to make, uh, uh, you know, substantial amount of money each year. Uh, by leasing a portion of their property to my client uh, to erect the signs in question. And so, you know, we want to do what's good for small businesses in Smyrna uh, and, and having small business owners be able to make thousands of dollars a year in, in land rent uh, is important and having uh, local businesses be able to use uh, advertising signs as a method to communicate uh, their operations and what they have available to the city uh, is important. And so, you know, we really want to allow, you know, Smyrna to continue to grow and thrive by providing these advertising opportunities. Um, and so, you know, my client is, is willing uh, to uh, withdraw a certain number of applications uh, especially ones in that initial map uh, that are located in the sitter of the city, sitter of the city, city, excuse me, um, and is willing to, uh, you know, be flexible on the number of locations and, and focus uh, the sign locations on the periphery uh, of the city. And I've, you know, I've got a map that takes away the the center locations and just shows the the outer locations. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be a part of the record, but I'll, it'll show you the, the locations that we're talking about vis-a-vis -vis the entire group. Um, and so, you know, if the city were inclined to uh, be willing to, to talk uh, and discuss uh, options other than litigation, you know, my client's willing to do so, uh, willing to come down in the number of, of sign locations and where they're located, uh, and also willing to, uh, make the signs available uh, for public safety and emergency, amber alerts and the like, uh, and also give the city uh, advertising uh, up to four times a year on each of the uh, sign faces uh, in perpetuity, uh, if that's something that the city is interested in. Um, but uh, I, I state that just to, to make it clear that, you know, we're here to, to do business with the city uh, if there's an opportunity to do so. Uh, but uh, I will keep the, the ninth application separate, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, seeing none, I'll go ahead and uh, call up our city attorney for Smyrna, Scott Cochran. I'm rarely here. I'm, I'm usually at, at a different vantage point. It's nice to see you all at this vantage point. Let me just start off by saying that a couple of the issues that he raised, as he said, he had to raise to preserve for the record. And those aren't issues to be resolved today. One of those is the constitutionality of this. That's for another day. The, the other one is the adoption of our sign ordinance. That's for another day, right? So all those are things that under Georgia law they had to put on for the record. But that's not really for you guys, as he said, to declare <clears throat> that whether the ordinance is constitutional or whether it was properly adopted. From what I 
heard it was advertised to a public meeting and then tabled from that public meeting to another public meeting and ultimately heard. If those are the facts, those, those are things that, that lawyers argue in court and judges adjudicate and appellate courts end up deciding. So, so those aren't really the issues for today. Um, so we kind of get to, of, as far as these first eight, to the, the process. And so there is a, uh, one of the arguments is that the process that community development undertook violates the ordinance because it wasn't done timely. So you have in your package, and I'm gonna make part of the record, all of the applications, right? All the applications that were filed. Um, the uh, applications, as you said, are, are done on a portal and that they're filed on a portal and there's communication through the portal. And if you can see in those applications that there was communication between the applicant and the community development through emails that were distributed through the portal. That was communication up until a few days before the denial letter. So, so what we have here is a situation where from, from day one, the application was filed on the portal, communication was done through the portal, it was done through emails that were, that were sent through the portal to an email address that is an address on the front of the application. Right? And, and, and then at the very end, the denial letter was sent the same way that all the other communication was sent. And so I, I, I could imagine what would have happened here if, if this would have been a situation where this communication back and forth from the city to the applicant, from the applicant back to the city through email sent through the portal. I can imagine if through all that at the very end, the most important of everything was sent another way. Could you imagine? I mean, then we would be, uh, we would be challenged that, that we sent it in a way that we knew was different than the way they were communicating and, and frankly, less likely to get to them timely with the way the mail works now. So, so, um, so that's kind of the, 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 the practical effect of what, what happened here. The technical effect of that the technical effect is, is the way our ordinance reads. The, um, this is 82.5F, and it's in your, your pack. You've got a certified copy they said uh, sent uh, or they uh, offered earlier. It says, community development or its designee shall give notice to the applicant by hand delivery or mailing to the address on the permit application. It doesn't say postal mailing. It doesn't say certified mailing. It just says mailing. Well. Our position is that, that our community development's position is that mailing, emailing through the portal complies technically with this ordinance. So, so, so practically it was what had been done up to time and, and we think technically it also complies with the ordinance. We, uh, I mean, that's the, that's the way, that's the way court systems work now, right? I mean, everything in every court system in Georgia uh, whether it's trial courts or appellate courts or federal courts. You, you file things, uh, you file it through e-filing, through a portal electronically, and you get an email when it's filed, and, 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 and everybody involved in the case gets an email that something's been filed. That's just the way that it is now. So, so we think that, that this, this technical requirement that, oh, even though we, even though we we communicated with you this way up until a few days before these denial letters, you had to send the denial letter another way and if you didn't, you're tagged out. We, we don't uh, believe that that's true. And we think that we, we technically complied with the requirements of the ordinance. But what makes this more interesting to kind of be the tit for tat kind of thing is there's a process issue on the appeal because because if you look at our code section, this is, is uh, 8217E1, it, it provides that uh, the ab appeal from the denial of a permit can be heard by you all. Then it says this, provided that, those are jurisdictional, uh, it's a jurisdictional phrase, you guys can hear the appeal 
provided that written notice is filed with the clerk within 10 business days of mailing of the mailing from the community development director. So, so if, if, if we're right that, that mailing, the emailing is a type of mailing because our mailing uh, requirement doesn't specify that it's got to be a certain type of mail. If emailing is a type of mailing as contemplated by this ordinance, then their appeal's late. Their appeal for the first time, they're, they're untimely. They, uh, they appealed the, um, the, the denial was emailed through the portal. You know, the community development director or its designee, the portal is the designee to send these emails. That's the way, they, the way that everybody had involved in this had done it up until a few days, up until that last decision, the, that last letter. And so um, the, um, it, it, the letter was sent through the portal, the email through the portal on May 6th. 10 business days from May 6th is May 20th. And, and the earliest date that their appeal reached the clerk's office was June 5th. It, it came here twice. It came here June 5th, that's the earliest date, and then uh, about a week later, it, it, it came another time. And guess how it got here June 5th? Their email. You know, so it's like, well, they can email, I mean, we email up to date, they email their appeal, but oh, when we send this other thing, we've got to, uh, we've got to deviate from the way we've done it, and email, and mail doesn't include email in that situation. So, so anyway, uh, our, our first position for the record is that their appeal for those initial eight, uh, the appeal is untimely, and uh, as a result, it, uh, it should be denied. Um, then, if you look at the, the merits of things, the, um, all of the letters, there's, there's separate letters for each of these eight uh, sign applications, right? All of the letters specify the reasons that, that uh, the uh, application is denied. And um, <clears throat> so, so, all eight were denied one of the reasons they were denied is because our ordinance prohibits poll signs, right? It defines poll signs and says poll signs are prohibitive. All eight of these were poll signs. Uh, another uh, reason that the letters say that the um, um, applications should be denied or, or were denied are that none are ground-based monument signs, and our uh, code section requires ground-based monument signs. Another reason that all eight of these were denied is because they were all in zoning categories that limits the size of a sign to 32 square feet and the height of a sign to eight square feet, I mean to eight feet, right? So, so all of these, um, all eight of these appeals involve situations where those three ordinance provisions were violated, okay? And that's, that's if you, uh, get to the merits of this. Um, and then six of these, six of the eight, were properties that already had ground-based monument signs, right? And our ordinance limits the number of ground-based monument signs in, in certain zoning categories to one. And this would have been two. And so for that additional reason, they were denied. So, um, so, if you get to this issue of the railroad, and that's, I, I know these guys, I've, I've, I've looked, these, these good lawyers, you know, they, they, they do this, this um, uh, type of work throughout the uh, state. Uh, they've had some success, I think, on, some, on, on a lot of this, but, but the issue of, of the um, railroad right of way is different here. The railroad, it, it's, it's railroad right-of-way that sometimes isn't subject to zoning. It's not just any property the railroad happens to own. The railroads can own property that's not within the right-of-way, right? And that's what's happened on one of these, the one that's the, the rail. We have one railroad right-of-way in this initial eight, and then the one we're going to argue in a minute is a second railroad right-of-way, one alleged railroad right-of-way. 
the one in this initial eight, which is the railroad right across the street here, is not within the railroad right of way. You, it, it's, it's a separate parcel where the facts will show that had a different use by the railroad than being the right of way of the railroad it, it, at one point. So it's a separate tax parcel that's zone, it's part of the zoning code. You know, and, and, and so, so, so the issue of whether property that's within the railroad right of way is subject to zoning is irrelevant. It's a red herring in this initial eight that we're arguing because the uh, property it issues not within the railroad right of way. It was, it was either a, a, a depot or a parking lot or, or, or whatever, but it was it's not part of the railroad right of way. Um, that's been we've we've looked at that and it's been can be measured. So. Um, So the appeal as to this initial as to the initial eight is our, our position should be denied as as, unta as untimely and also on the merits. And so I'll answer any questions that you guys have regarding those initial eight. Thank you. Uh, seeing no questions, um, I will entertain a motion. Yeah, I'll. Um I'll make a motion related to, oh, let's see here, 24 70, 24-71, 24-74, 24-75, 24-76, 24-77, 24-78, and 24-79. Uh, the appeals of these denial for these permits uh, were not timely filed in the manner required by the sign ordinance. They were filed more than 10 business days after the mailing of the community development decision, and this is contrary to section 82-17E1 of the Smyrna sign ordinance. Thus, the appeal should be denied as untimely. Um, also, addressing the merits of the appeal, I move to affirm the decision of the community development department denying these permits, each for the reasons set forth in the denial of the letters uh, dated May 6, 2024, issued by the community development uh, regarding each application and further move to direct the city attorney to prepare a written summary of this decision. Okay, we have a motion. Do I have a second for that motion? Second. Second by Mr. Welch. All those in favor of Mr. Lindley's motion uh, will vote now. Ms. Hines, how do you vote? I vote in the Mr. Lindley's motion passes 7-0. Um, we'll move on now. We have two other uh, locations in that group uh, outside of the two other ones. Uh, this is numbers 120 and number 93. And I will now call representatives from Atlantic Billboard up. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I certainly don't want to uh, belabor the point uh, and go through uh, the entire song and dance that uh, we just went through. Um, I, I will state uh, a few differences um, regarding this particular location. Um, and I'll, of course, you know, let Mr. Cochran make whatever arguments he'd like to make uh, in response. but. Uh, in, in this particular appeal, as I alluded to earlier, um, it's our position that there was a timely uh, denial and that it was properly uh, sent to us uh, via mail, um, which is what the uh, ordinance requires. Uh, mail to the address doesn't say anything about email, doesn't say anything about electronic transmission. Uh, we're talking about mail to the address. Doesn't say email address, it says the address. Uh, and so with respect to uh, this final application, uh, we're not disputing that it was timely denied and it was properly denied. 
uh, and, and I don't expect the city to contend that the uh, appeal uh, was untimely, uh, given that it was sent via email and mail uh, to the city within uh, the time frame required by the code. I would note for the record, however, that uh, the code is silent as to how appeals must be filed, uh, which is in stark contrast to what the code requires uh, with respect to denying an application. Uh, but that's more an issue for the first eight rather than for this one. Uh, but it's important to note the differences. Um, but if you look at the, uh, the map that, uh, the certified zoning map that I introduced uh, during the first appeal, and I'd like to make all of those exhibits part of the record for the purposes of this appeal as well, um, that map will show that uh, the railroad uh, location where this sign uh, is proposed is unzoned. Uh, and so therefore, based on uh, the arguments that I made uh, with respect to the first eight, uh, the city doesn't have the authority to, uh, to deny uh, the applications. Um, and my clients had a similar case uh, against uh, the city of Clarkston and against uh, DeKalb County um, over these railroad locations. Um, and in both cases, uh, you know, the courts ruled in favor of my client uh, and and oddly enough, you know, we made a similar offer uh, that I'm willing to make uh, at the conclusion of this hearing to Clarkston for free advertising. Uh, they, they turned us down. Uh, eventually my clients got the permit and now the city's paying $25,000 a year for advertising on a sign that they could have had for free. Um, it doesn't sound like good business, but that's the city's decision to make uh, and that's what Clarkston decided to do. Um, but. You know, so we feel that the law is clear that when you're dealing with unzoned railroad locations, uh, the applicants got uh, the right to do uh, with the property as they, as they like, uh, and so the permit should be approved. Uh, I'd also uh, restate uh, the zoning procedures uh, argument that I made with respect to the first eight. I'd put that on the record again for this appeal uh, and state that uh, the ordinance was not properly adopted, the, the sign code. So even if this, prop, this application was not on an unzoned parcel, uh, there's no valid code in place to prohibit uh, the requested sign, and so therefore it should be approved uh, for the reasons that I put on the record the first time uh, with respect to the first eight. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'd also state for the record uh, that we do contend uh, as to this ninth application that it, the uh, city's code is unconstitutional under Georgia law uh, based on our arguments that it uh, violates the least restrictive means test, uh, and of course the ordinance presumes that all signs not expressly allowed are invalid, uh, which is the antithesis of the First Amendment under the Georgia Constitution, uh, according to the Georgia Supreme Court. Um, so, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, belabor the point and go through the whole song and dance again. I would just ask that the arguments that I made with respect to the first group of eight uh, be made part of the record on this one. Uh, and I'm more than happy to stipulate that Mr. Hawkins can do the same. Uh, I don't want to waste uh, any more uh, of y'all's time here tonight. I know these meetings can last a long time, and I want to be sympathetic to everybody's time. So unless anybody has any questions, um, I will uh, let Mr. Cochran present what he'd like to present. All right, seeing no questions, I'll call up Mr. Cochran. Thanks really quickly on this one. So um, I guess let me start off by saying that the, uh, the other sign appeal on the agenda is um, you guys aren't pursuing that, right? The, um, I think it's 93. 93, 93 you're not pursuing yeah, that. Yeah, 93 we did not appeal because the city determined that it was outside the city limits and so we're not pursuing. Okay, so we're only doing. Only dealing with one target. All right, Got so it. we can we can just have for the minute for the minute said the 93 is is, is withdrawn. So that uh. all right. As far as uh, 24 120, uh, this property is alleged to be on the railroad right of way. Again, um, position is that uh, that that really doesn't matter. Even if it is in the railroad right of way, it prohibits it's prohibited by provision of the ordinance. It's not tied to zoning. So the provisions of the ordinance we mentioned earlier that all of the eight that we previously talked about uh, violated 
One was the pole sign. Well, the, the prohibition against pole signs tied to zoning uh, in the code. If you read the code, it, it, it references zoning. Uh, they, um, it also, um, the, the issue of, of height and size, those are tied to zoning. Uh, but what's not tied to zoning is this limit, um, is this uh, requirement for the signs to be ground-based monument. It, it, that applies to all signs, regardless of whether the sign is in property subject to zoning or not. If, if you just read our ordinance with that in mind, there's, there's several prohibitions that this initial eight violated that are, are, are specifically through the ordinance tied to zoning. This one's not. This applies to all signs regardless of where they are in Smyrna. If they're not otherwise exempted, they are um, required to be ground-based monument signs. And so uh, for that reason, it should be uh, denied or the, the uh, community development uh, director's decision should be upheld. Uh, we don't have arguments as to the process on this one, uh, even though the email address was on the front of the application on this one, just like it was on the other eight. Uh, we sent it both ways because by the time this was processed, they were already chattering about the fact that the other eight weren't timely in their view. So that's the reason it was done out of the bunch of caution. It certainly wasn't done because they thought they had to. So that's all. Anybody have any questions for me? Thank you. Um, seeing no questions, I'll entertain a motion on uh, number 120. Yeah, a, a motion uh, related to 24-120. I move to affirm the decision of the Community Development Department denying permit 24-120 because the proposed sign is not ground-based monument sign and further move to direct the city attorney to prepare a written summary of this decision to the interested parties. Mr. Lindley has made a motion. Do I have a second? Second by Mr. Pickens. All those in favor of Mr. Lindley's motion, uh, please vote. Ms. Hines, how do you vote? I vote in the affirmative. Okay, thank you. We're going to take a hand vote for this. We're having some technical difficulty. All those in favor of Mr. Lindley's motion. And that passes unanimously, his motion. Okay. That is all the business we have on the agenda for this evening. If there's nothing else to be brought before this body, we are adjourned at 8.12. Thank you all very much.